Pray with results, part three. This is going to be so exciting. So let's just jump right into it and ask God for help. Precious Heavenly Father, we receive the help of your precious Holy Spirit on assignment by Jesus to help us, to be our advocate, our spiritual standby and strengthener. So Lord, we receive your help. We need you. Unfold the Word of God, the treasure map of life, so that we might get praying with results. That's important to us. We need your help for it, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about prayer with results, but power, supercharged results. Pray with results. In this session of Pray with Results, Power, I want to talk specifically about how elimination is essential to accumulation, progress, growth, increase. Let me say it this way. What you're willing to let go of determines what you're able to take hold of. Elimination is reciprocal to accumulation. For example, when you go into a grocery store, right? As you add food to your cart, you eliminate money from your wallet. Here's another example. You cannot add value to your marriage without first eliminating something that's holding back your marriage. It may even be something good for something better. When you gain understanding, you eliminate ignorance. Alcoholic Anonymous can't give you help until you eliminate the lie that you don't need help. In parts one and two, we've learned that faith is the key to being able to pray with results. You and I get to authorize God's power in our lives in this world, all in the name of Jesus. So the question is, how do we develop our faith to get results, to supercharge prayer results? If faith increases, what must decrease? The Bible asks, what communion has light with darkness? Let's learn how to optimize the potential for faith in our lives to supercharge our results. After all, God has given you and I a role, a part to play, a responsibility to activate our faith for results. Dolly Parton once said this. She said, a peacock that rests on his tail feathers is just another turkey. <laughs> Folks, we done got too many spiritual turkeys and the world is in major crisis of hope and their identity. Let's get up off our feathers and activate our faith because we are called to pray with results. The world is depending on you and me to get results when we pray. It's not just for you. Results matter for this world. Consider this. Viewing something online. Viewing something online is different than ordering something online. We all agree on that. Let's say you're looking at something for sale on Amazon. That's different than ordering that something on Amazon. Viewing or wanting is not ordering. Placing an item in your virtual cart is not the same as ordering, right? No transaction has been activated yet. When you're viewing something online, you're interested and possibly hoping for that thing. When you go to the stage of ordering an item, your hope becomes the substance of faith, which is transactional. It's working. You placed an order. That's what a prayer of faith does. It authorizes or it places officially the order. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 1 to 3. Now, faith is the assurance, title, deed, confirmation. Now, remember that. Faith is the assurance, title, deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. For by this faith, this kind of faith, the men of old gain divine approval. By faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds, the universe, the ages were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And that makes even more scientific uh, sense now, today, than it did a thousand or two thousand years ago. A prayer of faith places the order. Faith is the order or the receipt 
which is the confirmation. Like a virtual order, we get to use our faith to import blessings and miracles from heaven's unlimited supply to earth. We are importers. If we choose not to pray, then we passively choose not to import God's help, his wisdom, God's healing, his free gifts of blessings, his victory, and his overcoming. Those ignorant of God's word can find this disturbing because they believe, they believe that God's blessings should just automatically come upon a world needy of divine intervention. Here's the thing, though. That would mean God's will or desire would automatically overrule and dissolve the autonomy of every individual. It would invalidate your design as being made in the image of God with a free will. You wouldn't have the right to choose between right or wrong, life or death, because good would override your power of decision. You see, that's the justification socialists claim when taking away individual rights. Override humanity's choices and their merit so that a chosen few can rule the way they think best, the masses. Prayer intersects earthly living with heaven's gracious giving. Let me say that again. Prayer intersects earthly living with heaven's gracious giving. Now, religious thinking tends to resist this because they prefer the emphasis to be on earning God's approval to in some way merit getting your prayers answered. Oh, I deserve to get my prayers answered. God's grace is key to praying in faith. We put our confidence in his loving kindness, in his grace, and the righteousness that he imparts to us. Look at Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up, talking about Jesus for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? Did you get that? Freely and graciously, not earned or deserved, but freely and graciously. God freely gives, but that doesn't eliminate our need to ask and receive. Not once, but over over and over and over and over. Look at what Jesus says here instructing us in persistent prayer. He says in Matthew 7, verse 7, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking reverently and the door will be open to you. So do you need this or do you need that? Do you need this or do you need that? Do you need X or do you need Y? There was a poster I saw one time and it said, Dear Lord, please don't let my husband be home when all my online orders arrive. Amen. (laughs) We ask God for things that, let's be honest here, that we think will make us happy. All of us have in one way or another prayed prayers that we believe the answer will make us happy. What we need to be aware of is simply this. Happy does not always equal good. You may eat six or seven of your favorite donuts, but that doesn't mean it's good, good for you. You may feel happy indulging in a shopping spree with your credit card, but that doesn't mean it's good, especially when your bill arrives 20 days later. Happy is not necessarily synonymous with good. So a prayer that you think will result in your best could be seen differently by God. A lot of times it is seen differently by God. You might be asking for X, Y, Z, thinking it'll be the best, and that God in his infinite wisdom and his knowledge, he might be saying, well, X, Y, Z will harm you, but A, B, C will truly bless you and fill you with maximum joy. Part of the process of prayer is coming to the knowledge of what God knows. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think in infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. Now you can ask big, but God can do super abundantly above big, beyond all that we could ever ask, think, imagine, hope, dream, or pray. 
You've got nothing on God when it comes to asking big. That's why we really should rely on him to help us ask for the desires of our heart. He knows us better than we know ourselves. After all, he designed us by his precious Holy Spirit. I remember as a little boy being offered a dollar bill or 18 pennies. Well, of course, I went with the bigger quantity. 18 is better than one, right? Not only that, 18 pennies is heavier than a tiny piece of paper. With my young, immature thinking, I would have gone for the 18 pennies even if the paper bill had a hundred written on it. Do you know why? I was not trained in comprehending value yet. I was so young, I doubt I even recognized the number 100. You and I were much the same when we make requests in this finite context to an all-wise, all-knowing, infinite God, unlimited in His knowledge. So why don't we trust Him to lead us in our prayers? Because much like that two-year-old I was, we actually think we know better. Tony Robbins once said this, he said, successful people ask better questions and as a result, they get better answers. Have you noticed that I always invite the Holy Spirit to help us when we approach the instruction and teaching of God's word? I do that because Jesus said he would not leave us alone or without help. He said in John 16 verse 13 that the comforter, the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth and show us things to come. People who are not conscious of Holy Spirit's help or His presence as they pursue the truth can too easily get religious. I've seen that a lot. In John 4, Jesus told the woman at the well that the day had come when true worshipers, did you hear that? The true worshipers would worship God in spirit and in truth. Truth needs the spirit or it's deactivated. It's latent. It's remote, and even it can get religious. Truth is designed to move in your life, and that requires the precious ministry, the help of the ultimate helper, God's Holy Spirit. Do you want that? Right now, even as I'm speaking, as I'm preaching this, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who baptizes you, so open up your heart and be filled as you hear God's word. Amen. God is good all of the time. That's an absolute. Never assume that your vision of good even comes close to Heavenly Father's reality of good. You don't know good like God knows good for you. Oh, my friend, you don't have a clue the good things He has for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, But as it is written, Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love Him, who love God. God holds the patent on good. It's a kingdom trade secret. James 1, verse 17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, and God never, ever changes His M.O. He's always good, always merciful and full of loving kindness. Why would we ever assume we know how to pray for good for ourselves or for our family or for others without God's help in even defining or discovering what good is? Just imagine if we were to stop praying thousands of words from Bible illiteracy and start praying even just seven words in prayer, in spirit, and in truth. Prayers that totally line up with God's eternal word with motives that are in line with his heart. When I don't get results from prayers I'm praying, then I quickly take responsibility and look to God for correction, adjustment, tweaking, and even his perspective. I assume I'm not asking good enough, so I say, God, elevate my ask. Promote my request. Help me to better petition for your divine will in this situation. Before you got saved, you might have thought this person or that person would be the best candidate for a political office. Well, that makes sense. When you're without God's influence, you are easily moved by the optics, bias. But when you give your life to Christ, you are under his lordship, which means you are all to be influenced by his goodness. Jesus being your Lord and Savior means you don't vote your idea or your rights. No, no, no. You vote God's will, so you need to submit to His will. 
You may like the other guy's haircut, his personality, or the fact that he or she hangs out with exciting people in the entertainment industry. But you see, that doesn't move God. He sees what we don't see. God knows what will be good and doing what God says is good. You may get what you want, but you may not want what you get. That was said by an old time preacher years and years ago, but in a broad respect, it's true. Remember this series is not called prayer. It's called pray with results. It's about power. God has no problem getting us his best. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Isn't that what we just read in Ephesians 3.20? So what's the problem? Why does it seem getting results is such an anomaly or a rarity for so many? Well, first of all, Ephesians 3.20 didn't end there, did it? It gave a condition or a correlating factor. It was according to the power that works within you. Interesting. God's ability to do exceeding abundantly is proportionate to the power that works within you. The power that works within me. Does that bother us? Does it imply a responsibility that maybe we'd rather avoid? Some people, some people like blaming God. They like having the option to be able to blame God for everything. It's really starting to make sense what Jesus would often say to punctuate a miracle in someone's life. He would say, your faith has done this. In Matthew 9, a woman with an issue of blood that could not get any help or relief or healing anywhere, she simply touched the hem of Jesus' garment and was healed. Now, how did Jesus respond to her? He said this, he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. Do you hear that? Your faith, your faith has made you whole. In Matthew 9, there were two blind guys wanting to be healed. Jesus simply said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Jesus told his disciples in Mark 11, if you you had faith, you would say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it would, be, it would obey you. Faith is the power that works within you. It is the supernatural force at work in your life, giving God's goodness access to your life. You must admit you see too many examples of precious people that seem void of God's goodness in their lives. Well, is God a respecter of persons? Meaning, does God play favorites by just randomly picking winners and losers and one person gets more while another person gets less? Well, let's look at what God's word says about this. Romans 2 verse 11. For God shows no partiality, undue favor, or unfairness. With him, one man is not different from another. One woman is not different from another. One person is not different from another. God shows no partiality, none. We'll look at Acts 10, verse 34. And Peter opened his mouth and he said, Most certainly and thoroughly, I now perceive... And understand that God shows no partiality and is no respecter of persons. Do you get that? The Bible is saying God doesn't differentiate between Jew or Greek, between rich or poor, between young or old, male or female, between black, brown, red, yellow, white. Faith is the differential. Faith is what makes a difference. Do you have faith? Show me your faith because remember, faith is the title deed. Do you have the title deed? It's the evidence. Now, considering what we just read, let's take a look at Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as of you as were baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union and communion with Christ, have put on, clothed yourselves with Christ. There is now no distinction, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is not male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, are in him who is Abraham's seed, then you are Abraham's offspring and spiritual heirs according to the promise. You see, this doesn't mean God doesn't know the difference between a boy and a girl. It means he doesn't regard one gender over the other with regard to his blessing of childhood status by faith in Christ Jesus. We're all one in him, all spiritual heirs to his great promises. Faith in Christ is the power that works within us to download into our life the inheritance, to receive the answers, his promises. 
Now, you can have or be a legitimate heir and not experience what is yours. You can own land that you choose never to visit. You can own a car that you never drive. You can have food that you never choose to eat or medicine you refuse to take. It doesn't mean it's not yours. It just means you're ignorant of the blessing and refuse to appropriate the blessing. Why? Most of the time, it's a lie or a fear that corrupts our faith and causes us to disbelieve. Sometimes it's an offense or bitterness. It becomes unforgiveness, stalling our faith. Remember this. The Hebrew nation of Israel, after being delivered from slavery in Egypt, they were not able to come into the promised land for one simple reason, unbelief. The book of Hebrews says they had an evil heart of unbelief. It wasn't their failure to do everything just right or even that they they hadn't sinned. It was their stubborn unbelief of God's word. This is why God cannot save an unbeliever. It's not that God doesn't love them enough or doesn't want to. He does. It's not that he doesn't care for that life. He does. It's the faith connection. God cannot work where he's not believed. God can't save where he's not believed upon. God can't move where there is no faith in him. So now we're back to the subject I opened the segment up with elimination. It's key to accumulation or going forward, growth, answers, to being able to pray with results. You see, faith in God welcomes the mighty hand of God. To trust in God is to connect the will of God with results on earth. Faith activates, whereas doubt deactivates. Hebrews 11.6 says, faith pleases God, not good works, but faith, not big sacrifices, but faith. You can sacrifice and it does not please God at all. Why? Because faith pleases God. And if what you're giving is not in faith, the motive is a form of unbelief. Could be manipulation, bribery. It could be fear or even pride. How do we get God's power working within us? Well, from part two, you know there are tools we can employ to activate God's power on the inside of us. God's word has amazing transforming power. I'm a huge fan of Romans 12, verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love that. Notice it says transform, not changed. You see, we all need our minds constantly renewed and the washing of God's word over and over and over again does the supernatural work. The more I study God's word, the more I believe God's word. That means I automatically place less and less value on what I feel, what my opinion is, or even what my own understanding is. But sometimes there are deeply rooted carnal doubts and unbeliefs called strongholds. That can short circuit your faith. That's a big problem. Does God have a tool to go after that kind of thing? Absolutely. Second Corinthians 10 verses four and five. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. These are powerful weapons God has given us, but to employ them requires focus and faith. That means we must eliminate the distractions of this life to bring these weapons of spiritual warfare to activation like a laser. Have you ever watched someone welding? They bring the flame, the torch, to a white hot focus where the flame turns blue, then they hold it on the spot needing the work done. What has God given us in our tool belt to accomplish this type of focus? Elimination. We get to choose to eliminate the distractions, the voices, the cravings, and subject our appetites to censorship. No, you can't have that hamburger. So let me just talk briefly about fasting. Fasting is a tool God has given us to bring a focused heat to the use of our faith. Now, this is critical. Fasting does not please God in and of itself. Faith still is the force that pleases God. If fasting becomes an act of sacrifice that indulges the flesh in an act of, hey, look at me, look at how religiously sacrificial I am, 
Your fasting has just cut off your faith because your motives are wrong. Instead of using the tool to get the flesh out of the way, you're actually making it an act of pride and indulging your fleshly instinct for attention. It's never about what you do, but all about what he do. Fasting is to focus your spirit, not indulge your ego. Look at Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. Jesus talking, he says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. There's a good idea. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So you can eliminate like a hypocrite or you can eliminate to gain God's rewards. Isn't that amazing? Fasting should be all about focusing your attention on what God has done, is doing, and what he wants to do. Not about, look at me, I haven't eaten anything for days. That's your reward. You got your reward. You got the results of your fast, bragging rights for not having eaten a hamburger. What a waste. Fasting isn't buying God's favor because Jesus had already purchased our salvation and our right to be the children of God. You can't get any more insider blessed than that. Fasting is just a tool to get your flesh out of the way and focus your attention on God. It's saying no to your appetite so you can focus your yes entirely on God's word. His inspiration, Father God's preparation for exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Fasting must, it must be an extension of your faith or it's a waste. It's useless. It's even offensive. I'll give you a few good stories and more insight in part four on how to fast. There is a physical health aspect to this. So please don't just jump into fasting without first getting wisdom and getting counsel. Like any power tool, use it right or it will be a liability. Always get good instruction. Right now, let's activate our faith and pray according to God's word to get heaven's results here on earth. Jesus taught us this new way of praying 2,000 years ago after he came out of a prolonged time of fasting in the wilderness. Can you believe it? Jesus, the perfect son of God, fasted. He eliminated food and afterwards went forward, the Bible says, in power. That's Luke 4, verse 14. He went out in power and part of his powerful ministry to us was to teach us this amazing prayer to get heavenly results here on earth. In Jesus' name, let's you and I agree in faith and pray this out loud right now. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.